Hello everyone, I'm Afaf Kanj and welcome to South South News. We're delighted to have joining us today the permanent representative of Iraq to the United Nations, Dr. Hamid Al-Bayati. Ambassador, welcome to South South News. Thank you very It's so much. nice seeing you again. It's nice to be here, thank you. Thank you. From the top, uh, let's talk about security issues in Iraq. Um, we know that U.S. troops are mandated to leave the country on December 31st uh, of this year. Is Iraq ready in terms of its own security as, as ongoing violence is, is, still, is still the issue, even with reports coming in early today? The assessment of the Iraqi government, both actually the Iraqi and the U.S. government, that Iraq is ready to face challenges. Our security forces is competent, and we have enough forces to maintain security in Iraq. However, we still need some equipment, especially when it comes to airplanes. The Iraqi government was planning to buy 18 F-16 American jet fighters. However, that has been postponed for the next year because uh, the money which was allocated for buying the airplane now went to buy food, the Russian food card, and uh, providing people with essential needs for food, you know. Very well. Tell us a little bit about uh, the newly formed, uh, you know, government and also alleviating um, Chapter 7 issues at the United Nations Security Council. After the elections, uh, it took us a um, long time to uh, form this government. This is a national unity government in which almost all the winning parties participate in. Um, we still have three positions, which is security ministers, still not um, approved by the parliament because we are looking for independent uh, professional ministers. However, the situation is good. I was in Baghdad between December 23rd and I came back in January 13th. I went to different provinces in Iraq. I went around in Baghdad during the day in the evening. Everything was normal for me. Security situation was really good comparing with the situation when I left Iraq in 2006, coming to the UN, and even when I visited Iraq several times, meantime. So I can say the situation is good. However, services still need to be improved. People still feel that um, they need electricity, water, sewage, and other services. Absolutely. So let, let's talk about development, Ambassador. As, in terms of uh, Iraq's growth uh, and, and its relationship with the United Nations, which is a very good one, uh, there are, there's a newly signed agreement with, uh, I want to say, UNICEF, UNDP, and the United Nations Development Fund with the government of Iraq, really in terms to help it realize its national plan and the items on that agenda, including the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. Is that plan in action? Are mechanisms in place? Update us on situation in that respect. Well, um, the challenge after 2003 was um, security situation in Iraq. Because we had vacuum, we have military vacuum. When uh, U.S. Ambassador Paul Bremer uh, dismissed the army yeah. and the police force, and then we have security vacuum because all security organizations were dismissed. Now, um, after focusing on security and military issues, I think the next step is reconstruction. The Iraqi government had a huge plan for reconstruction to increase oil production, gas, and other production in order to have enough revenue to rebuild the country. Everything in Iraq needs to be rebuilt. After a long time of war, since uh, 1980, Iraq-Iran war for eight years, and then the invasion of Kuwait, the liberation of Kuwait, desert fox, desert storm, etc., etc. All these wars disrupted almost everything, especially the infrastructure. And now the government is putting a plan, a very ambitious plan, to create jobs and to rebuild everything. And they, of course, they encourage foreign investment in Iraq too. So the, I can say that the, this government is a government of rebuilding after uh, we have a government of uh, maintaining security and improving security in Iraq. Very good. Speaking of rebuilding, I have to ask you a question, if I may, on education. Iraq is historically known to have some of the most premier engineers and, and philosophers and etc. So I'm wondering, in terms of revitalization, what is Iraq doing um, to rebuild itself in that way? As you mentioned, you know, the infrastructure was really um, demobilized in terms of our universities and, and even, you know, the cultural and, and heritage of uh, background of, of, and civilization, really, in terms of its history. What is Iraq doing? Uh, in terms, and the government, in terms of really rebuilding itself um, in education? Uh, it's a, a big challenge, the education, because Saddam abused every system in Iraq, including the education system. 
So it will take some time to rebuild that. But in general, the Iraqi government start again to send students with scholarships to different parts of the world, to the U.S. They send in one year 10,000 students. But they are focusing on medical field, engineering. Um, I mean, the planning ministry is, is putting priorities for scholarships. However, the government, of course, is, is announcing every year that they will send more and more students to have high degrees, master and PhD degrees in order for the country to compensate um, you know, the elites who left the country, the human resources uh, which left the country. And um, um, Iraqis are very good. You know, uh, a lady who was uh, sent uh, uh, from Iraq, she had a Fulbright, uh, you know, uh, award because she was number one among her her colleagues in the um, in, in that is, uh, that term. So really, I mean, the Iraqis are. Uh, I think they can go back to the golden age, the golden time when we have uh, doctors, engineers. You know, we have the first lady graduate as a doctor in 1930s, and she became uh, a lecturer at uh, medical school in Baghdad. We have the first minister in 1950s. That old days hopefully will come back, but we need some time. Absolutely, and it takes time. I have a question on um, economy and investment in Iraq. As it is rebuilding itself, it's coming out of this post-conflict situation. What are some of the opportunities in terms of investment? I understand that Turkey, other neighbors, other countries are beginning to invest in Iraq. Where is Iraq ready to do business? We are ready to do business in every field, and the government is giving incentives for all companies from all over the world. And I start with oil because oil is the major uh, source of income in Iraq. Iraq um, uh, granted contracts and you know agreements with international companies from all over the world. European, American, Asian, even African uh, companies managed to get some contracts. Uh, so um, we have um, companies developing oil fields. And just today I read a piece of news that ExxonMobil, which is the largest oil company in the world, they managed to increase the production in one of the fields to more than 10 percent, which was the minimum requirement for them in the first stage. So there is a promising um, situation for oil and gas. Once we have increased our production, then of course we'll have enough cash to um, rebuild the country for reconstruction. And uh, the incentive has been given to all companies to invest in Iraq. Um, and for example, housing sector, the government allow foreign companies to buy and own lands and to build houses and to sell it to people. There is a, an agreement between the government and the uh, Iraqi Trade Bank to give mortgages uh, to Iraqi people. This is the first time in the history of Iraq we have a banking system where people can get mortgages to buy houses and apartments. So there is a, a movement. It needs time, as I said, because destruction is easy. And what Saddam destructed in 30 years cannot be built in one or two years. Absolutely. In terms of, of uh, its development, um, critics have said uh, issues of, of transparency, for example, when it, surrounding the oil. Um, what can you tell us in terms of uh, uh, Iraq and its transactions becoming more transparent in terms of oil and production and investments? Experts from different parts of the world um, express that the, the process of granting, um, granting these contracts for, for companies, oil and gas companies. It was transparent and it was the best system. It was clear in front of everybody. Uh, so, and um, Iraq, in the beginning, only British petro Petroleum managed to get a contract because it was low, low uh, payment for the company. But then when other companies noticed that Iraq is um, adamant that they don't give contracts with easy terms. They follow suits, and now we have contracts with um, international companies for less than $2 a barrel, just as a service contract, and we don't have sharing production agreement. So there's no sharing with oil. Oil is the Iraqi-owned um, uh, products, and companies give services in return of certain payments. Dr. Al-Bayati, let's talk for a moment on climate change. You know, in, in a post-conflict situation, most countries have to put climate change mitigation on the back burner, whether they like it or not. But issues like drought in Iraq are very pertinent and very serious. What is Iraq doing to mitigate issues of drought and similar issues in terms of climate change mitigation? 
climate change in Iraq is a very important issue because Saddam uh, dry and uh, drain the marshes in southern Iraq. The marshes is thousands of uh, square kilometers f uh, covered with water when uh, the river Tigris meets the, the, the river Euphrates. And what's after, after the invasion of Kuwait and the liberation of Kuwait, Saddam tried to drain all the water because he couldn't separate his tanks and artillery after the invasion of Kuwait and the war to liberate Kuwait. That caused uh, desertification in Iraq, less rain and more storms, dust storms. Now um, the Iraqi government uh, um, put really an ambition plan to restore the marshes. They managed to restore over 50%. And in this habitat, in this unique habitat, which has been there since Sumerian civilization 5,000 years ago, it's not only the water, but we have bears. Bears will come from Europe, from the Soviet Union, in the old days, all over the way, during winter, to nest in the marshes, and then they will go back in summer, because it's very cold in East Europe and in, in, in Soviet Union. Mm. Now these um, birds start to come back. Fish, bird, all kinds of animals live in such such water area. Besides, the people in the, in the marshes used to live on rice, which need a lot of water and fish. And with the draining of the marshes, they immigrate like a million, one, one million, more than one million people left the marshes to different areas because it's become desert. Now the government is restoring that. Not only that, but planting. There are green fields and green belts all over the, the country because of the wars. Um, one example is that Iraq was the richest country in the world with palm trees, and we used to have uh, like 30 million palm trees in 1950s. Now we have 8 to 9 million, comparing with United Arab Emirates, which had none. Uh, they had zero palm tree in the 50s. Now they have 40 million. So imagine Iraq went down from 30 to 9 million, 8 or 9 million. United Arab Emirates, they went up from zero to 40 million. Imagine if there was a, a wise leadership, how many trees we could have all over. And that will help with climate change and desertification and the drought. The drought is not only Iraq is suffering. Many countries in the region, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, um, they were suffering in the last um, three, four years from drought. Hopefully by having you know, um, a good relation with neighboring countries such as Turkey and Syria, we could, we could um, you know, have regulation for the water usage in these rivers passing it through these all three countries. Absolutely. It sounds promising anyway. It looks like there's been some development, especially 50% restoration of the marshlands. Then That's very exciting. I've, I've heard from yeah. officers more than 50%, including Dr. Latif Rashid, the Minister of Water Resources. That's wonderful. Let's cross over, Ambassador, to ICT for development, information communication technology. It's something that South South News really believes in for the development of any country. Tell us what Iraq is doing in terms of ICT, in terms of building uh, broadband capabilities, in terms of internet access for its people, whether it's for e-government services, um, you know, e-education, e-health. What are some of the capabilities um, in plan or in, or in action today? Well, it's important to mention that um, before 2003, no cell phones were allowed in Iraq, no satellite was. Uh, allowed, no internet was allowed. So Iraqis, uh, are almost 27 million people, were they were deprived from all that kind of technology. Since 2003 until now, we have almost every household, every family have more than one cell phone. Everybody has access to internet, and uh, even communications became much, much better. So. Um, we were late in, in, in getting that technology, but we are in the process of having that technology available for almost every um, individual in Iraq. Um, we still, of course, lagging behind because, because of uh, the former regime policies, but hopefully we could compensate by encouraging all these things. And um, the government announced that soon they will give, we have three uh, telephone, cell phone companies, they will give a license to fourth one, and the, again, all these lessons, they were given in a transparent uh, way to companies who compete with each other regarding the licenses and uh, other things. Ambassador, my final question to you is maybe more on a personal note. Um, from your perspective, uh, from the UN, from working, of course, uh, advocating for Iraq and its development. Now, let's take a look at the past only to comment on what we'd like to see for the future. 
The former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, in fact, named the war in Iraq illegal. Many people say that that war was, or the various wars were, unjustified, even though clearly uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was uh, in practice a demagogue. Um, what are your what is your call? What would you like to tell the international community, people watching us today here on South South News, what would you like them to know about Iraq, its people, and their desires? Well, uh, let me start by saying there's always double standard, and there's double standard in the United Nations as well. It's very obvious for everybody. Now, um, in certain countries like Libya, when there is killing of civilians, the United Nations interfered. The whole international community interfered. Before Iraq, international community interfered in Bosnia and Kosovo and in other places. Do we allow um, genocide to go on? I know we have a genocide in Rwanda in the 90s and the whole world regret what happened. Even these days when officials talking about Libya, they said we, we shouldn't allow a genocide happening there. And there was no genocide. Saddam used chemical weapons against Iraqi people and against neighboring countries. In one attack in Halabche on 16 March 1988, he killed 5,000 people with chemical weapons. Mostly were elderly people, women and children, because young people managed to flee. Um, elderly people and uh, women with children, and they couldn't. So um, from our perspective that Saddam committed international crimes or crimes which is punishable by international law, such as war crimes, he launched several wars against neighboring countries, genocide uh, um, and uh, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, he, he launched ethnic cleansing against the Kurds, against the Assyrian who are uh, you know, indigenous people, the Christian community. Uh, it's a peaceful community in Iraq. So all those crimes, I think they deserve to be to be handled and conducted by the UN and the international community. With all respect to Kofi Annan, he's got his view about the situation in Iraq, but we believe that the UN really had responsibility. They should set up uh, a tribunal, and we try our best in the opposition to set up an international tribunal for Saddam Hussein, similar to the former president of Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic. Why uh, there was a trial for certain criminals and dictators and what not for Saddam. So to answer that, we believe that we didn't want to see a war as Iraqis. We said a war will cause uh, civilians um, casualties, a war will cause damage and uh, destruction for the infrastructure, a war mean occupation. We want Saddam to be um, on trial, international trial, uh, such as um, the one set up by Security Council or an ad hoc trial we, I was part of an organization in London called the Indict. We collected evidence against Saddam for crimes, war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. But unfortunately, the international community wasn't ready to help and support the Iraqi people. The uprising of 1991, the people of Iraq rose up against Saddam following the uh, invasion and the liberation of Kuwait. 14 provinces were liberated. But the international community turned a blind eye and Saddam slaughtered 500,000 Iraqi people. So getting it off Saddam was uh, really the dream of the Iraqi people for 30 years, and we think that that dream has been fulfilled. It's our time now, it's our um, turn to rebuild our country and to uh, go back to the golden age, as I said, or golden time where Iraqis live in peace and harmony among themselves with other countries, especially neighboring countries. Ambassador Abayati, what a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm Afaf Kanja. Thank you so much for joining us here on South South News. We'll see you soon.